get it made as Chinatown. Just wanted to say that. Such a quintessential Aussie sentiment. So I make my way here through Chinatown. So Australia didn't have an exclusive white Australia policy in 1780 or 1805. Only developed it around uh, the turn of the 20th century, beginning of the 20th century. So there used to be a lot more Chinese and Japanese here. Then after we got the exclusionary white Australia policy steadily implemented in the first 70 years of the 20th century, the number of uh, Chinese and Japanese in the country steadily declined. But we've always had a Chinatown here in Sydney. It waxed and it waned. But now about uh, between 15 to 20 percent of Australia's population is Asian. And I was listening to Richard Spencer here. He did an interview with a philosopher named David Skirbina. So let's play some of this. seems to be how the early critiques went. It was, it was just, you know, this was a cultish, weird group that were rabble-rousers and troublemakers and we just don't like them. That was kind of kind of what the Roman, the Roman view seems to have been. Do you, do you think it spoke to a bit of a different perspective on divinity in the ancient world in, in the sense that in my reading of ancient texts, you don't get a kind of skeptic in, in the uh, version of the world, the word that we know today, uh, you know, attack on Zeus, you know, where, where's the evidence, where's, you know, so on. I, I think it... Yeah, so what it means to be divine definitely changes depending on time and place. So David Skirbina is an atheist and he's presenting his understanding of the mythology of the, of the origins of Christianity. Probably spoke to just a, a different perspective on what the gods were. And in some ways, you know, fundamentalists of today are more rigorous and demanding a kind of historicity. I mean, I, I even remember when I went to an Episcopalian service the last Easter, um, the priest yeah, there's no sense of historicity in the, the 13th century, 1,000 years ago, 1,500 years ago, 2,000 years ago. People weren't talking about historicity. So that's a relatively post-enlightenment concern. I, I, would, I would say, I said, you have to believe this. You, this isn't just some narrative that you can draw the wall from. You, you actually have to. Yeah, even the very notion of, of belief is different. So the ancients experienced the world differently. So it's not just a matter of the conservatives and liberals believe different things. They experience different things. To be conservative is to have more of a traditional or medieval mindset. Obviously, some conservatives are more medieval than others. Well, to be liberal is to have a more modern mindset. What do you mean by modern? We get down to here different understandings of the self, right? The liberal modern conception is the self is buffered, is strategic, autonomous, basically good, rational. And the traditional sense of the self is that it's porous, right? What's going on outside of it affects it. And tends towards uh, wickedness and so we have these two very definitions various definitions of the self and so conservatives experience the world differently from liberals right there's more magic in the conservative or traditional worldview there's, uh, there's, there's higher realm of the sacred right. and so it's not so much a matter of belief but conservatives have experienced the divine differently than, than modern liberals and so the ancients too experienced divinity differently they, they experienced divinity in a thunderstorm right. they experienced divinity in an earthquake all right so they are much more mindful of sacred spaces sacred peoples, 
than the moderns who increasingly live in a less magical, mystical world. Boy, so you not only drive on the left side here in Australia, you also walk on the left side. I think in some ways to his credit, he was taking his religion seriously, but I, I think maybe in the ancient world, um, they, they just had a different perspective on the divine and to, to suggest that, you know, did Zeus really come down and, um, you know, Father Perseus, or, this was kind of missing the whole point and we're kind of projecting our own, you know, viewpoints backwards. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's a very modern scientific way of thinking, right? To ask for evidence and construct logical arguments for proofs. Right, to ask for evidence to construct logical arguments, right? This is, uh, this is a different way of thinking than what the ancients or the medievalists experienced. Yeah, that, that kind of stuff. That, you know, that doesn't come about until the 1600s. So prior to that time, it was just, you know, I don't believe you, you know, or that sounds crazy. And, you know, of course, none of them were really on sound basis, right? I mean, they all had their own competing gods and mythology. So it wouldn't do any good to say, hey, your god has no evidence, because actually my god has no evidence either. So what the heck? We're right. So equal ground. So. So in the ancient world, if uh, your country won in a conflict or your people won in a conflict, like your god won, and the conquered peoples accepted your deity, and it wasn't so much a matter of belief, it was a matter of real life experience. People experienced in that world, and they experienced the, the divine in a whole different way than we do. Yeah, so that is uh, somewhere where uh, Judaism and Christianity are different, but these are religions that make historical claims that uh, God entered human history. There seems to be a 2,000 years ago an almost kind of new perspective on religion where this actually happened then and there and we're going to report on it. And, and so I guess there's there's this kind of double quality to, to Christianity in that sense in, the, in that it does have a pretense of historicity, which I think is really powerful and important to it. Um, but then it's also, you know, reviving other myth systems and kind of spinning them and, and, and so on. And, and I think maybe that maybe that doesn't allow us to kind of see mythicism correctly or the, the mythical, mythical quality in Christianity correctly um, because there, there is something kind of... So, you know, if, if you understand your religion, you're not really religious, all right? <laughs> like if you understand spirituality, you're not really spiritual, all right? For a genuine religious or spiritual person, this is a realm of mystery and you only get you know, intimations about how it works. So to, once you stand outside of religion and try to understand it using you know, secular rational terms, you have left the religious experience. Modern about Christianity in the sense that it was a real God, a, you know, a, a, a somewhat poor carpenter who came out and spoke and told moral lessons. It, it's something that can kind of appeal in a way to a more modern sensibility. Uh, but that kind of blinds us to the, the mythic quality and the essence of Christianity as well. Well, again, you know, keep, right. I mean, the, the New Testament does read like kind of like a transcript at points about what Jesus mm -hmm. said. It's like you're actually sort of there. That was kind of the idea. But of course, you know, that, that general idea had been around for a long time. I mean, we can go back to Plato's Apology, which is basically a transcript of what Socrates said in his own defense, and it was 500 years, 400 years prior to the time of Jesus. So, so everything has similarities with what went before it and differences. Right. Right? So there are similarities between Judaism and the cultures and religions that surrounded it and in which it was embedded. There are similarities and there are differences. There are similarities between Christianity and the cultures from which it arose and differences. But just because you notice things that are similar between Judaism or Christianity or Islam and the cultures from which these religions arose doesn't mean that you deny that there aren't innovations and changes. Right? You could list off you know, five ways that I'm different from Laponius. That doesn't mean that there aren't 15 ways that were similar. So there was a long intellectual tradition of that happening, and, and I highly suspect that Paul and the New Testament writers were aware of that tradition. Um, and of course they were aware of the mythological uh, traditions, the pagan traditions, and I think they sort of saw this little blending merging of the intellectual respect. So Christianity is explicitly claiming to be grafted on to the, to the religion of the Jews. But what's not explicit in Christianity are as profound 
roots in Hellenic yeah, okay. mystery cult religion. Right, that's not made explicit, but yeah, it's I just under the surface. You know? So yeah. Christianity throughout its history is kind of oscillated from the Hellenic mystery cult, pagan ritual sacrifice cults, and its Jewish elements. So during the course of the 19th century, it appeared that uh, biblical criticism was just going to completely destroy Christianity. But then Christianity took a turn away from historical criticism to other forms of textual criticism that weren't as threatening to its fundamental theology. And then there was, uh, you know, figures like Bruno Bauer, uh, who uh, Marx got into uh, various disputes with, but, but there was, a, there was a, a kind of atheism brewing out of the Hegelian tradition, um, you could say, as well. But maybe talk a little bit about that tradition, because I, I actually find that interesting. You know, we, we sometimes seem to be reinventing the wheel of, you know, new atheism, or, you know, Richard Dawkins was the first man to ever question whether God exists. And, and that's actually kind of ridiculous that this is a, a very long tradition. Maybe talk a little bit about that. I, I find that intellectual history really interesting, and then also how... Your, uh, your, your version of this is, um, is is quite different, in fact. Yeah. All right, so skepticism about the gods, I mean, you're right, that goes way, way back. I mean, I, I would go back again to the ancient Greeks, you know, because, uh, you know, Socrates talked very little about the gods or just sort of in a little hand-waving kind of way. And, yeah. You know, Plato talked about the demiurge, and, you, know, uh, it's, you know, the world soul, but those are sort of very distant, abstract things. And Aristotle kind of had this world mind that was kind of turning the cosmos, but again, a very abstract, philosophical kind of being. Um, so, so you know, they, in, in no sense were those like sort of modern gods, which is like a personal being that you can kind of talk to and you pray to him and, you know, give you forgiveness and so forth. So, I mean, that's those, those are very old ideas, right, to sort of be skeptical about gods that look like humans, the anthropomorphized kind of mm -hmm. gods that we are, have traditionally associated with religions. Um, and that, that kind of comes and goes over the, over the years. Of course, with science, right, that gave, gave it a whole new book, books, right, in the 1700s in particular. Scientific reasoning, you know, starts to say, well, look, we don't even need these, these mythological tales anymore. We can just talk about materialistic explanations of things. And then they look at the Christian story and they say, oh, by the way, there's a lot of weird contradictions in that story and things that don't seem to make sense. At the same time, the German anthropologists are digging up, you know, ruins and, and hunting for evidence in the Middle East. And they're finding that things aren't where they're supposed to be, and they're not finding evidence of cities that are mentioned. They're like, well, maybe that city never actually existed. You know, maybe this thing is a lot newer than it would seem to be, or maybe a lot older than it seemed to be. And they were starting to get actual data that was conflicting with the story. The story had internal contradictions. And then that raised people like, yeah, Bruno Bauer and Reimers and, and uh, you know, early, you know, uh, David Strauss, who were really kind of really started to press hard on the Christian story. And they're like, hey, this just this, this don't fly. There's, there's major problems here, <laughs> internal and external. And that really started the ball rolling. I think. Definitely. Um, so, so what are what, what you are offering really is it, I guess is kind of picking up on um, instances in Nietzsche of focusing on Paul, and I, I think you actually lay it out in your book quite well, where you're saying okay, you know there there is a lot of you know mythical criticism of uh, of the Bible and so on, but we actually need to get to intention and motivation, and this wasn't just some accident or or an honest mistake in the sense that the people doing this really believed it. Um, at, at some point, they were consciously creating a myth that they wanted to have, uh, that, that they wanted to have an effect in the world. And so, yeah, granted, when we're looking back in history, you always have to use some informed speculation. You can't know things for sure, but you actually... So in politics, you often see people lying you know, for a noble cause. So, and Republicans say that Joe Biden's not the legitimately elected uh, president of the United States. They're lying for what they see as a noble cause of, of rallying the... A Republican base and you know, crusaders against this or that will often you know, exaggerate the harms of whatever it is that they're crusading against. So lying or exaggerating in service of a noble cause or in service of your people, very common human phenomenon. It's not just restricted to religion. So can intuit uh, a certain intent and motivation uh, in people's minds. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I mean, I think there's a very clear motivation. I think Nietzsche was maybe one of the first to pick up on it, uh, although it wasn't really very clear because just the way Nietzsche writes, it's sort of scattered bits and pieces in his writings. It takes a lot of work to pull those threads together. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I mean, Nietzsche had the right, right basic picture. The picture is you got, you got uh, Jewish power structure, Jewish tribes who were in power today in Samaria. Until 63 BC, 
D.C. when the Romans come marching in and throw them out of power, the Romans take over, and the Jews, like anybody else, would have been highly incensed at these foreign intruders. Okay, so that's important for understanding the origins of Christianity, that uh, there wasn't a Jewish power structure running Palestine at the time of Jesus. The Romans were running it. It was the Romans who would crucify people. Crucifixion was not something that uh, Jews practiced. Right? Crucifixion was something that uh, Jews found horrific. So Romans are kind of shadowy characters in the New Testament.